This talk explains the kinds of things that you can measure with a homemade astrolabe using the designs that are up on my GitHub page. This even works if you're dealing with a lot of light pollution. The Bordel scale goes from 1 to 9, 1 being the most perfect dark night sky with no moon, up to Bordel 9, where it's completely light polluted and all you can see are a few bright stars and planets and not much else. My data were collected roughly border, Bordel 8 or 9. So you can't see very much, but you can see enough. So for my home, for instance, if you're looking at the constellation Orion, you can see a few of the brighter stars, but not a lot of detail. If you go out to the Shenandoah National Park, where the skies are much darker, this is Bortle 4, you can see a lot more. It's much nicer, it's much easier to avoid getting lost, but it's not actually necessary to get plenty of data. And of course, if you were to go back before light pollution was a problem, you could see a lot more. So if you have the opportunity to see a dark sky, I suggest you do it. Now in antiquity, they did not have a telescope, but they did have astrolabes. So this talk will explain what you can see with an astrolabe and what you can measure with an astrolabe, provided you're careful and patient enough. Now one might say an astrolabe is the ancient equivalent of a modern smartphone. It's a multifunction device. You can measure elevations and heights of objects, tell the time, determine your latitude and longitude, measure the location of planets, measure planetary orbits, and do many other things. And the reason for this is because it converts between the geocentric coordinates of right ascension and declination and the local coordinates of azimuth and elevation. You can make an astrolabe for instance, you can cut uh, using a laser cutter. You can cut it out of plastic. This is the primary astrolabe that I used, is a laser cut astrolabe made at American University's Design and Build Lab. Although it, a perfectly workable one can be made out of wood and paper using the same plans. And even in a pinch, you can use laminated paper. Where do you get the plans? Well, they're up on my GitHub site. Here are the links. And the analysis that I'm showing you in this talk, and as well as the data, are also available there as well. All of the graphics are generated using a Jupyter Notebook that produces SVG files. You could directly cut the SVG files with a few modifications, although I, I found it much nicer to retouch them for aesthetic reasons. Uh, additionally, the most difficult part of this retouching part is to ensure alignment of all the various pieces, in particular the front and back of the astrolabe. If you would like some help on that, be sure to contact me. But the point is that all of the mathematics and the labeling and the star charts are brought on board by way of this Jupyter Notebook, and so it handles most of that transparently. Here's the anatomy of the kind of astrolabe that you might make if you have access to a laser cutter. It contains a few pieces, a main body that has a front and back, a star chart, which is a transparent sheet, and two pointers and a screw. The two pointers are identical and symmetric. Plans are available on that GitHub page for making them out using a 3D, uh, 3D printer, but it's not necessary. You can make one out of wood, and it's perfectly passable as well. Just remember, when you produce such an astrolabe like this, the stars go on the front side. Don't over-tighten it because the plastic is delicate. Uh, and make sure to choose your hole diameter to fit the screw. You may have to adjust the ones that are on my plans. Uh, as I said, the pointer doesn't have to be 3D printed, although these ones here have been. Now, it is said when all else fails, perhaps you should read the manual. Uh, the manual for astrolabes that I have typically referred to was written in 1400 by none other than Geoffrey Chaucer. Yes, the same gentleman who wrote Canterbury Tales. He also wrote a treatise on the astrolabe. It is said that this is the first known technical document written in English prose, and it is still very readable even now. I followed his design quite closely with a few changes to suit my preferences for modern timekeeping. I prefer to use calendar months rather than the signs of the zodiac, uh, and I prefer to incorporate the sun's right ascension, as I'll explain, into the calendar scale. This is probably below the level that can be measured easily. And additionally, 
Chaucer did not have ac easy access to a trig table uh, or an electronic calculator that computed trig trigonometry for him, or even a slide rule, so he had one on the back of his astrolabe. Since I have access to at least a slide rule, and of course an electronic calculator, I, I prefer to make use of that vacated space for an equation of time. This turns out to be helpful if you would like to know your, la your longitude. Now, my data set uh, was collected from my home, mostly in my backyard. I keyed each observation to universal time, and it includes 770-odd observations over the course of three years. In each of those sessions, I made several different elevation sightings uh, for a total of about 2,000 elevation sightings. Over the course of those three years, I went through six different astrolabes, although in the end settled on uh, the larger astrolabe made out of 3D uh, laser-cut plastic. There, I used no optical aids, no telescopes or binoculars, with, with one exception, uh, the daytime sightings of Venus required a binocular. Uh, from this data, I computed the local sidereal time and the solar time, as well as planet-right ascensions. There's a variety of objects that I've observed. Uh, most of them are stars, although you can see that the star, the sun, was observed primarily in the day, as one might expect, while the other stars are observed at night. Uh, the moon and Venus are the exceptions in terms of objects that are visible both in day and night. Venus during the day requires optical aid, as I noted. It is possible to observe Jupiter during the day, although I did not attempt this. How do you take an elevation sighting using an astrolabe? Well, if you look at the back side of my astrolabe design, such as you might find on GitHub, the outermost scale is intended for taking elevation sightings. So if you see a star at some particular elevation, you sight that star through the center screw, uh, and then find where the pointer uh, intersects that outer scale, so in this particular case, 8 degrees. Now this seems very simple, and from a mathematical standpoint it is. Although in practice, it's rather more involved. Uh, it takes some practice, and you have to balance several different tasks at once in order to use the astrolabe to make an elevation sighting. Don't be discouraged if it takes you a few tries before you get good at this, or even takes you a few minutes to get everything aligned. Uh, although after some practice and 2,000 sightings later, I can do it fairly quickly. The key properties that you need to satisfy to take an elevation sighting is, first of all, the astrolabe needs to hang freely from your finger through the thumb ring. This ensures that the vertical is indeed vertical, so that an elevation of 90 degrees is indeed straight up. Make sure you're using the back side of the astrolabe. Uh, you sight the object so that it appears to sit right next to the center screw and skims across the top of the pointer. You'll need to vary the pointer up and down until the pointer seems to be as narrow as it can get and the object is just skimming across the top. Once you get everything aligned, you want to remove your other hand away from the instrument, although it's useful to keep it supported, for instance, if there is a, a gust of wind. And the final bit, which is the most tricky, is you need to alternate your focus between the object you're trying to sight, which is far away, and the astrolabe, which is nearby. This is a little bit tricky and takes some practice focusing your eye alternately on the object and the instrument. Once everything settles, then you can take the astrolabe, turn it, and read the elevation. As I said, this takes practice, but it's not too difficult to learn. Well, how accurate are these sightings? Well, I took a sighting, I took in total bit over 1,200 sightings of 12 distinct stars over the course of these three years. Uh, since the stars don't tend to move very much and they have a known right ascensions and declinations, you can predict their elevations using the current universal time and your known location. So a little bit of spherical trig goes into that. The analysis scripts up on my GitHub site will take care of that for you. And predict the elevation. If you take a look at the difference between the elevation that is measured with the astrolabe and their predicted elevation, the mean typically is uh, off by about just shy of one degree. The standard deviation is about 2.6 degrees. Turns out it's reasonably normally distributed, so that's indicating that most of the error is observational error. 
the fact that the mean has shifted a bit is actually largely due to the fact that you're skimming the object across the top of the pointer, as I mentioned, uh, and that's a little bit asymmetric. Other astrolabes have a top and bottom pointer that balances this error out a bit. Now, Chaucer warns you that the error will grow with elevation. It seems that the, the mean drifts a slight amount uh, from about 0.8 to 1 degree off, but it, the standard deviation doesn't change very much. None of these observations are good enough for navigational purposes, uh, but I had been suspicious for a long time that Chaucer was overblowing this. It seems that he might be, at least for this instrument. Now, this is all you need in order to measure your latitude. If you can find Polaris, the so-called North Star, and take its elevation and read that off, that will be your latitude. It's not exactly true north, but it's certainly within the, the plus or minus two degrees of error that you should get. So could you do better? Absolutely. You could average this out by taking many sightings of Polaris. Now, where are the stars anyway? Obviously, they're very far away. And you don't see very much parallax over the course of the year because they are so very far away. They don't appear to deviate very much from their daily circuit around the poles. So over the course of, a, of an evening, they appear to swirl around Earth's rotation axis, which is pretty close to where Polaris is. So therefore, we can assume that they're basically points at infinity, and the stars don't really move, although the Earth spins underneath them. So we can not lose anything by modeling the stars as being points on the unit sphere, enclosing the Earth, which spins inside. The axis of this sphere in which the Earth rotates is the North Star, Polaris, and the other stars appear to be stuck to the outside. So for instance, I've marked Capella and Sirius, two rather bright stars in the winter sky, as well as the constellation Orion. The coordinates of every star on this sphere are given by their, their local latitude and longitude on the sphere. Traditionally, these are called right ascension, which is the longitude, and declination, which is the latitude. Traditionally, the declination is measured in degrees, and the right ascension is measured in hours. This is suggesting that because the Earth is spinning, the right ascension has something to do rather distinctly with time, and indeed it does. So for instance, for the star Capella, it has a right ascension of about 5 hours and 17 minutes, and has a declination of just over 45 degrees. Now you might imagine where, or wonder where the axes of this are, the zero right ascension, and the zero declination are. The zero declination is just above Earth's equator. And the zero right ascension is conventionally located uh, at a point determined by Earth's uh, vernal equinox. Now, this leads you to imagine that you can make an astrolabe, an instrument for placing the stars spherically, and indeed you can, although these are rather difficult to make uh, and extremely uncommon. So to make a more convenient instrument, it's easier to project the sphere onto a plane. There are many ways to do this, the most convenient of which is called a stereographic projection. The way that you do this is you balance a plane on the north pole of the celestial sphere, where the stars are projected. And then you project each star out using a straight line connecting the star and the south pole, and figure out where this intersects with the plane. So effectively, you imagine light rays emanating from the South Pole, passing through the star, and landing somewhere on the plane. This means the North Pole ends up uh, right on the North Pole, the center of the plane. And all of the Northern Hemisphere stars appear near the North Pole, as you might imagine. All the stars that are in the Southern Hemisphere occur farther away. Circles on the sphere become the circles of the projection. Lines on the sphere also become circles. Uh, this gives you the following idea that lines of constant elevation, which are, appear to be circles in the sky, uh, end up becoming circles on the plane. They're, they don't, they're no longer concentric, but they get sort of spread out a bit. Curves of constant a con a compass direction, azimuth, also appear to be circles and lines in this plane. This is called stereographic projection. And this is the basic idea of the star chart that is used on the astrolabe. So if we take all of the stars with a computer, it's relatively easy to project them out onto the stereographic 
projection, the plane. So for instance, here are the stars again on the celestial sphere. So the star Sirius, a rather bright star, gets projected onto the plane very nearby the constellation Orion. The data on my astrolabe come from the European Hipparchus catalog, which is a, a space probe that was flown in orbit around the sun to collect the three-dimensional locations of the stars. There are since more accurate catalogs, but this is quite sufficient for our purposes. It is worth noting that the stereographic projection has the property that it preserves angles, which means that the apparent shapes of constellations that you see on the star chart on the astrolabe will agree with the shapes that you see in the night sky. This makes identification rather easy. So here is a picture of what the astrolabe star chart looks like. Again, here is Sirius and the constellation Orion. The top of Orion, the star Betelgeuse, is closer to the North Pole. You can see Orion's belt kind of smeared together along the dark circle, which is the equator. And there is a uh, cross through the star Rigel, which is a bit farther up. Polaris, the North Star, is once again in the center of this projection. The way that the astrolabe is made is that Polaris is actually punched out, and that's where the screw goes, so that all of these stars appear to rotate around Polaris, the North Star. Now, that star chart is kind of busy, so let's just remove just everything but the most visible, brightest stars. Certainly, if you have a dark sky, you can see a lot more than I'm showing here. But if you have a light polluted sky like I do, these are pretty much the most visible stars that you will typically see. Additionally, something that you will see is that there are <clears throat> two heavy circles drawn here. The celestial equator, that's the, that is the stars that appear directly overhead if you're sitting on Earth's equator, as well as the ecliptic plane. The ecliptic plane is the apparent path of the sun through the sky over the course of one year. It's offset from the equator about 22 and a half degrees. And of course, this is the, what causes the effect of the tropics uh, and ensures that we have seasons. If you would like to read off right ascension, that is measured in the <clears throat> nearly the, the second to the outermost ring. So this is right ascension in hours, and you read counterclockwise starting at zero. And so you can see that if I wish to measure a something like the star Altair, it will have a right ascension of around 20 hours, just shy of that, perhaps maybe 19 hours and 55 minutes. Declination is measured in degrees off of the equator. The equator is the heavy circle again. Uh, and you measure declination uh, either north or south. Typically, north is read out as positive and each of the lighter circles is 10 degrees. The sun can be located at any point during the year by using the outermost ring, the calendar ring. So what you do is you find the date, for instance, February 15th, and trace in through the center, so through the North Star or the North Pole. And where this line intersects the ecliptic is where the sun is located. This is the scale that I've modified that the apparent path of the sun goes a little bit faster or slower over the course of the year various times. Uh, these effects are incorporated into the star chart so that the position of the, the sun in the sky is correct. I don't think this ends up mattering very much in terms of accuracy, and Chaucer's astrolabe did not incorporate this effect. If you want to know where the other planets are, well, they're Fortunately for us, they lie within a few degrees of the ecliptic, so you might as well place them on the ecliptic. Chaucer advises you to do this. This is not exactly true. The moon is actually somewhere around five degrees off of the ecliptic at any given time. And this is a feature of our solar system. We now know, having seen roughly a thousand other solar systems at the time of this recording, that many other solar systems are not quite as flat as ours. Their planets appear at pretty much anywhere on the, their respective astrolabes. Additionally, asteroids in our own solar system can appear pretty much anywhere here. But because most of the planets lie very close to the ecliptic, you can figure out what their right ascensions are using only elevation sightings. I'll show you how to do this in a little bit.
Now, unfortunately, the astrolabe cannot predict what the planet right ascensions are. If you happen to know what the right ascension of a, of a given planet is now, it's hard to tell what it would be at some later time. Many astronomers over the years have tried to remedy this, and ultimately we had to wait until Kepler discovered his laws, and later Newton formalized them into dynamical laws, uh, in order to figure out how to do this systematically. It really took two lifetimes worth of data, both Tycho Brahe's and Johannes Kepler's lifetimes, in order to gather enough data to discern the true pattern. But now we have plenty of data and quite accurate predictions that you can use. Now, that describes the star chart. The other part of the astrolabe is the body. Here is the front of the astrolabe. The front of the astrolabe contains contours for constant elevation and constant azimuth, which is compass direction with respect to true north. The constant elevation circles emit not from the North Pole, but are centered on the zenith directly overhead. This, the distance between the zenith and the horizon is in fact your latitude, so the front of the astrolabe is actually latitude dependent. If you laser cut this, you could only use it near the latitude for which it is made. This talk does not discuss the azimuth contours or the medieval unequal hours, both of which appear rather prominently on this particular astrolabe and are also described by Chaucer in his manual. However, you should note that the top of the astrolabe is south, the bottom is north, the left is east, which is where things rise from, and the west is where things set, is on the right. If you were to make an astrolabe for the southern hemisphere, this all gets rotated by 90 degrees, putting the north at the top and the south at the bottom. The horizon line is the outermost circle, and I've marked in heavy every 10 degrees and every 5 degrees in light elevation circles. You'll notice they're not concentric, and they, they fit between the horizon and, the, eleva and the, the zenith. Now, if you change to a different latitude, for instance, here is for latitude 45, you can see that the elevation contours shift somewhat. So indeed, the curves do depend on latitude. This particular astrolabe was made for use in Hungary with a latitude of 45 degrees, as opposed to this one, which was made for the Washington, D.C. metro area with a latitude of 39 degrees. What this means is, if you want to travel, you probably need several astrolabes. Medieval instruments often had the curves cut onto a removable brass sheet. Now, the astrolabe interacts with time, and keeping time using the Earth, which is a big spin spinning ball of rock, is kind of annoying because there's several different things that might be useful for measuring time, but it works well if you keep consistent as to what time you want. Now, going from the most technological savvy to the least, we typically use the mean solar time zone time, because that's what our clocks use now. One day is exactly 24 hours, all the time, every day. And it's keyed to time zones, which are kind of complicated, actually. Although, that roughly speaking, they're rounded to the nearest 15 degrees when measured off of our longitude zero, which happens to pass through Greenwich, England. Now, if you happen to use mean local solar time, which effectively no one uses in practice, uh, one day is still 24 hours. The local variations are smoothed out, but you're no longer keyed to the longitude zero. If you use a sundial, that is apparent local solar time, the day length varies plus or minus 20 minutes over the course of the year. Some days are shorter, some are longer. And if you use local sidereal time, which tells you where the stars appear in the sky, the day length does not vary, but it's not 24 hours. It's based on the fact that you end up accumulating an extra day as the Earth spins, because the Earth is spinning and going around the sun in the same way. The latter two, the local apparent solar time and the local sidereal time, are displayed directly on the astrolabe. To get the mean local solar time, my astrolabe has a scale to fix this. Chaucer's does not. And to get the time zone time, you need to know your longitude. In fact, looking at the difference between the mean local solar time 
read out from the astrolabe with the appropriate compensation, and the time read out on a nearby clock, you can ultimately determine your longitude. So how do you solve first for sidereal time? Suppose we cite the star Sirius at 20 degrees elevation. First of all, start by finding the 20 degree elevation contour. Then, locate Sirius on the star chart. Putting these two pieces together, the astrolabe will probably look a bit like this. You'll notice that the star Sirius and the 20 degree elevation contour are not coincident. But you can rotate just the star chart, the clear plastic layer, so that Sirius lines up with the elevation contour. Now, there are two ways to do this. You can either rotate to the left, in which case Sirius will be on the rising side or the east side of the astrolabe, or you can rotate it to the right, in which case Sirius will be on the setting side. You need some other information to tell which of these two it is. Either, perhaps, you have been waiting and have seen Sirius progressing higher in the sky or lower, or progressively getting lower setting, and that would be enough to determine which of these two possibilities you have. You could, for instance, know if you have a compass which direction you're looking. If Sirius appears to be roughly easterly, then you're on the left. If it appears roughly westerly, then you're on the right. Or if you have no, no idea whatsoever, then you need to cite another star and use the fact that that other star will help you disambiguate. Let's do that. Let's suppose we cite Rigel at 37 degrees elevation. Rigel is on the left side near the 37 degree elevation contour. In fact, it's pretty much right on top of it, marked in blue. So that means that the left side configuration is correct. You will notice on the right side, Rigel is much, much lower than Sirius in the sky and therefore not anywhere near the 37 degree elevation contour. So once you've gotten the right configuration of the clear plastic star chart with the background elevation contours, you can read off the sidereal time by aligning the right ascension ring time with the due south line, the line that cuts through the center of the astrolabe and goes directly through the top. In this particular case here, the sidereal time looks like about 345. To check your work, you can check to see if there are other stars that are visible as well. Betelgeuse, Capella, Procyon, and Deneb should also be visible in the sky, according to this configuration. What I usually do is I usually cite as many stars as I can, and then try to split the difference on the errors. I find this gives a more accurate sighting, because sometimes I might be off by a little bit more on one of them. Recall that the elevation errors can be off by roughly plus or minus two and a half degrees. That's the standard deviation, so they can be even quite a bit farther on occasion. So it's useful to cite as many stars as you can. That will give you the best chance of getting the right value and the right configuration of the stars. Don't feel bad if initially you can't get a good elevation sighting more than a few times. Just keep practicing. Now, once you have the sidereal time, you can find the local solar time, the local apparent solar time. How do you do this? You locate the date. So for instance, say February 15th. Find where February 15th appears on the star chart. Trace a line from the center out along that, passing through the calendar, and read it out until the, the second to outermost, or penultimate ring. That will tell you the local apparent solar time. So in this particular case, the pointer is pointing pretty much at 1745. This is the local apparent solar time. And if you're near a time zone boundary, uh, this is either going to be very accurate or very inaccurate, depending on whether you're on the east or west side of that boundary. If you're somewhere in the middle, it probably will be kind of about right to what a clock would be saying. You would typically expect to be within about 20 to 30 minutes of this. That's not so bad. Now, you might say, well, all of these alignments, how, what do, how do I do these straight lines? This is what the pointer on the front of the astrolabe is for, is to make out these tracings. You use the pointer on the back to get the elevation sightings, and the pointer on the front to measure off times. Now, if you instead, if it's daylight and you cannot see these stars, at least you can see the sun, hopefully. So what do you do? You place the sun on the ecliptic using the calendar scale. As a reminder, for February 15th, trace 
out from February 15th from the North Star and find where it intersects the ecliptic. That's where the sun will be. At that point, you can just rotate the sun as if it were any other star based on an elevation sighting. Now, you should not look at the sun while you're taking an elevation sighting. Instead, cast a shadow using the astrolabe. This is actually quite accurate and, in fact, was the strategy that sailors would often use when at sea because you can cast a shadow on the deck and get a fairly accurate to within much closer than a degree if you are careful. But in any case, at, at this point, the sun is just any other star. So you just turn the star chart so that the location of the sun intersects the appropriate elevation contour. And then you can read right off what the local time is. How well does this calculation agree with clock time? Well, what I've done over the course of the past three years is gathered data from a variety of astrolabes. Well, that's the colors on this scatter plot. And I've plotted the error in minutes off of the local mean time, i.e., what my clock says. I'm using throughout Eastern Standard Time and not correcting for daylight savings because, of course, the astrolabe doesn't know about daylight savings. You can see that my answers for the time are usually within about plus or minus 25 minutes, but there's some systematic variation going on. This is actually due to two effects from the Earth's orbit, the first of which is that the Earth's orbit is not quite circular, and the second is that the Earth's rotation axis, not being perpendicular to the ecliptic, means that it spins a bit faster, or appear, the Sun appears to move a bit faster on some days than others. There's a variability, a shift in the time that can be up to about 20 minutes. This is not quite saying that the day length can vary by 20 minutes, but th there's a shift by 20 minutes. The start of the day can vary. In order to take out this variation, we can use a correction that is applied to, uh, <clears throat> to the time that spreads out the variation over the course of a year. This is called the equation of time. It's not present on Chaucer's instrument, but is pre present on the back of my instrument. Before I get into how to do that, if you apply this correction, you can see that the error stabilizes and is pretty smooth across, in uniform across dates. In fact, the errors are pretty normally distributed, which again indicates that it's m mostly observational error. The mean is about seven minutes, and the standard deviation is about 57 minutes, which sounds rather terrible, uh, and to some extent it is. And this is because there are a variety of, of effects that are happening. We're not just getting elevation sightings, but we're also turning the astrolabe and reading off. This multi-step pro pro multi process causes errors to accumulate. Okay, but what, what about this negative 7.4 minutes? That means that local time at my house is behind the Eastern Standard Time by about 7.4 minutes. Now, time zones in my vicinity are rounded to the nearest hour, or 15 degrees in latitude, and Eastern Standard Time at my area is local to 75 degrees longitude. So if I take 7.4 minutes behind, that turns out to be an additional 1.8 degrees of longitude west, and that places my house at about 76 and change degrees west. It's actually nearly 77 degrees on the button, so that's not too bad at all. Now, how did I do this correction? Well, if you flip over the astrolabe, you'll see the center portion. The center portion is actually just a lookup table. It tells you how many minutes offset you should be, either plus or minus, based on the date. So, for instance, to use the date of February 15th, if you trace out again from the center of the astrolabe, you'll find that this is located at a sun slow i.e. you need to add 14 minutes or add time and each light ring is worth two minutes the heavy ring is zero so just count out and you'll see that you're about seven rings out from the center meaning that you need to add 14 minutes to the local time displayed on the front of the astrolabe in order to get your local mean time does it matter if we use the stars or the sun, which is just another star, but it takes an extra step. Not really. You can see that there's a little bit of a, a difference in bias. Uh, the stellar estimates, those that involve the stars, seem to have a little bit less bias. This is probably due to the fact uh, that there's an additional step of turning uh, on the front of the astrolabe that's necessary to, to get the sun to work out. But it's within one standard deviation. The two means are within one standard deviation, so it's not particularly st statistically significant. 
Now, let's do something a little more elaborate. On January 27th, for instance, I sighted the, star the planet Venus at 15 degrees elevation. Now, Venus is a planet. It's in our solar system, so it's always close to the ecliptic. But we don't really know where the ecliptic is, or where it is on the ecliptic. As I've mentioned, predicting the planets is not something which the astrolabe can do. It can only help you measure them. So we need some other piece of information in order to place Venus on the ecliptic somewhere. Well, the easiest one is the sidereal time. If you can see some other stars when you've sighted the planet, that will help position the star chart for correct time, and then you can intersect the elevation contour with the ecliptic to find where the planet is. So without belaboring the point too much, there happened to be two stars visible at the time that I was doing this observation. Uh, this <clears throat> allowed me to orient the star chart, as I've shown, and the 15 degree Venus observation is marked in blue, as well as the ecliptic marked in blue. Venus is at one of these two intersection points. Now, again, you need some additional piece of information to disambiguate this. In this particular case, I happened to note that I was looking eastward when this occurred, so it means that the intersection to the left of the astrolabe is the correct one. Additionally, the intersection on the right happened to be of too low elevation for me to see from my house. There are buildings in the way, so I know that one is not possible as well. Turns out that that Venus being a <clears throat> planet that is close to the sun, it's typically near the sun. So either it is rising roughly when the sun is rising or setting when the sun is setting. In this particular case, it was also early in the morning, just before sunrise. And so again, Venus is rising and therefore on the left side. So that's three different pieces of information that I had to verify that I'm looking at the correct intersection. So given that, I can read right off the right ascension without any effort. It's about eight hours and 10 minutes or thereabouts. If I do this many more times over the course of the past three years for all the planets that I can see, you can see quite a, quite a variety of data. I've marked the sun's right ascension in blue for reference. Uh, that's just read not by observing the sun, but merely by reading off the pointer on the astrolabe. You can see that I've seen Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, and Venus. Venus is the only inner planet. I did not see Mercury. And the other three planets are outside Earth's orbit. You can see that there's some interesting features. Venus hanging around the sun's right ascension for the most part. You can see that Jupiter and Saturn switched positions in right ascension relative to each other over the course of the data, including what was so-called the great conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter when they were actually very close in the sky. So close they appeared to be a single planet, perhaps called Sapiter. Additionally, you can see that sometimes the planets appear to decrease in right ascension rather than increase, which is their typical direction. So this is called when a planet is in retrograde. So you can see, for instance, Mars is in retrograde uh, during the latter half of 2020. And this occurs also for Jupiter and Saturn several times. The retrograde motion is a, an apparent motion due to the fact that the planets and Earth, from where we're taking our observations from, are in motion. Now, if we use Kepler's third law, which says that the square of the orbital period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of its semi-major axis, uh, then you can actually measure the diameter of the orbit. Now, this is assuming a sun-centered universe throughout, or at least sun-centered solar system. Kepler derived this empirically using, as I said earlier, two lifetimes worth of data and a real tour de force of polynomial regression. Later on, Newton provided a theoretical derivation of this from his loss, his dynamical loss. And it's not actually easy to do this. It actually involves some mathematical tricks, as well as one particular reparameterization that Kepler knew about. It turns out, as a result, large orbits have longer orbital periods. And if we could determine what these orbital periods are, we could measure the orbits. Now, unfortunately, orbital periods are orbital periods around the sun, and that's a bit complicated because the Earth is also moving, so it's a little tricky. It helps to constrain the geometry a bit to see what the right strategy is. If you're on Earth, an object that appears opposite the sun in the sky, so for instance, the purple object here, is said to be in solar opposition, which is to say that if you look up at the sky, the object 
is present or the sun is present, not both. On the other hand, solar conjunction, the sun and the object appear to be nearly coincident. On the, on the astrolabe, this also is visible. So an object in solar opposition appears on the opposite side of where the sun is. An object in solar conjunction appears right on top of it on the astrolabe because these objects are in our solar system constrained to the ecliptic. Just as a word of safety, do not look for solar, op uh, solar conjunctions without proper safety gear. You can damage your eyesight. Please do not do this. For this reason, I've only really looked for solar oppositions. Now, with an opposition on the other hand, you can ask how long between oppositions. This gives you the ability to measure the orbital speed in radians or degrees or some other angular measurement. Essentially what you want to do is use the orbital radius and the Earth's orbital period as a yardstick. See, the Earth travels at least one orbital period plus a little bit if the object is outside of Earth's orbit. And what this means is that if we look at the ratio between the excess time and how much time it took, that will give us an idea of what, uh, what the, the variation in the cube, the semi-major axis of the orbit is by the formula shown on the slide. So the Earth has traveled a certain amount of distance during the time between oppositions. That's the period T. Uh, sometimes this is called the synodic period. And on the other hand, while this has occurred, the Earth has traveled around more than one year's worth. The other planet has not. The other planet has traveled rather less. So there's a deficit in angle. So the ratio of these, if you square that, that will tell you the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. And this reads out in astronomical units, or Earth orbital radii. It took a long time before people knew how long an Earth orbital radius is. And so astronomical units were the norm. This works for an outer orbit. It also works for an inner orbit as well. But instead of using oppositions, you use conjunctions. Well, that's all very well and good, although you need to be a little bit careful that you don't damage your eyesight. So for Mercury and Venus, you need to use conjunctions. For the outer planets, say Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, you can use oppositions. Okay, so let's rebase my planetary data using their difference in right ascension from the Sun. Why is this? Well, because if you're looking for an opposition, that occurs when the difference in right ascension between the Sun and the object is 180 degrees or 12 hours. The Earth is right between the object and the Sun so their right ascensions are opposite each other. On the other hand, conjunctions occur when the right ascension difference between the sun and the planet is zero or 24 hours. So you can see here in, in this way, I get three good oppositions of Jupiter. They're shown in orange. They intersect the top opposition line. I get two good Saturn oppositions. The first one looks a little wonky. Venus hovers around conjunction. Of course, there's a horizontal gap because I did not want to look directly at the sun. Uh, and additionally, there's a horizontal gap through the middle because just due to my sleep habits, I didn't observe that data. You can see that I got one good opposition of Mars, but that's all. Okay, so Jupiter is the clearest of these cases. I have three good oppositions that I can measure the time between the oppositions. Around 402 or 408 days, you can see that actually gives you 810 days, so you can kind of split the difference, say 405. Uh, the actual figure is around 399, so not too far off, a few days off. Uh, and you can see that the astronomical uh, units diameter of Jupiter's orbit is supposed to be around 5.1, and I'm in the vicinity of a little bit over four and a half, perhaps four and three quarters. Not so bad. For Saturn, the figure is a little bit worse, in part because the oppositions, uh, I don't really quite get the lines of best fit are a little bit off. I'm measuring it a bit long as before, so a little around 380, 390 days, whereas the correct value is 378 days. So again, my orbital radius estimate is a bit small. It looks effectively like I missed the Saturn uh, opposition for 2019. Now, Venus, 
since I can't see oppositions, Venus never even goes into opposition, which one would have thought should be a dead giveaway that Venus is going around the sun, not the earth, because it never appears on the other side of the earth than the sun. Be that as it may, uh, I'm missing a lot of data. So to supply some of this data, I did use binoculars to make observations in order to see the elevation angle. So what I did is I figured out where Venus was. I have a YouTube video explaining how I did this. This picks up the blue dots on this scatter plot. Now I can't fit a line of best fit because Venus is really sloshing between uh, just above conjunction to just below con conjunction. So instead, let's fit a sinusoid because that's what it would actually be. What I'm showing here is the sinusoid of best fit. Uh, and it has a period of 652 days. The correct figure is 583 days. But since the errors turn out to be a little bit better in my favor here because the orbit is smaller, so there's a bit less error that gets accumulated. So 0.7 astronomical units, I'm pretty much in agreement. Remember, you have to use the inner planet formula here. What about Mars? Well, I didn't see two observations or two conjunctions. I didn't really get enough data to see this. But there is a repeat and right ascension difference, which should serve the same role if the orbit were circular. Mars's orbit is famously not particularly circular, but it's close. I get a period of 800 days between a recurrence of right ascension difference, and that puts it at about 1.5 astronomical units, which is pretty darn close to the accepted figure. I'm quite pleased. So in summary, an astrolabe is a powerful instrument, even if you don't have dark skies. You can certainly measure your location, your latitude and longitude, if you're careful and patient and collect enough data. You can get the time pretty consistently to within 30 minutes, often much better. There is a YouTube video where I've shown you how to do this in practice. You can find the current locations of objects in the sky, including Venus, even during the day. And this will give you enough information to measure the size of the orbits at the nearby planets. And based on this set of measurements, you can even suggest that because Venus never goes into opposition, at least it goes around the sun and not the Earth. So my suggestion is go outside, look at the night sky, make an instrument. If you have access to a laser cutter, you can certainly make use of that. The plans that are up on GitHub will certainly suffice for that. But if not, you could certainly use other materials and get perfectly good results.